Have you ever wished that your boss listened to you more? Are there things that you and your team would like to do but aren't allowed the time? Maybe you'd like to try some of the stuff that I talk about here, adding more test automation, introducing test-driven development, continuous integration, or pair programming perhaps. Maybe you'd like to think a bit more about improving the design of your code to make it easier to change. If so, then you need to figure out how to change how you work and maybe make your case to your boss to allow you to make that change. In which case, here are three ways to convince people. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're all helping us to develop our channel. So please do check their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about what really works in software development, and some of the reasons that you can use to convince your boss, check out my Better Software Faster training course. After all, what better way to convince someone than being able to create better software faster? In this episode, I want to try my best to answer the difficult and common question, how do I make change? And maybe even more tricky, how do I convince others to allow me to make that change? There's no simple solution here. There's no magic phrase that's going to hypnotize your boss into doing whatever it is that you tell them to. And I'm pretty sure that if there was, it would be a bad idea for me to tell you how to use it. But here are three strategies that I use for you to try for yourselves. I should begin though by pointing out that all three depend on one thing and ultimately you need that thing to make progress. You need to earn trust. What these three things really represent are ways in which you can establish that trust or begin to. Once the trust is in place, though, it will be a lot easier to convince people to try the next new idea that you come up with. An obvious and important starting point is data. Find evidence that suggests what, that what you'd like to try may be worthwhile. Now, the first thing to say is that, that that's unlikely to be enough on its own. Data doesn't really convince people. Human beings don't really change their minds based on data very often. They are much more likely to be swayed by em the emotional impact or by stories. This isn't good, it's just true. A pretty good example of this was the Spotify model. A few years ago, Henrik Nyberg did a fantastic job of describing Spotify's very good approach to team organisation. He did lovely animated infographics and explained them really nicely. There wasn't any data and Spotify and Henrik told everyone, this is what we did, it's not a model for you. How you get there is more important than this destination. Nevertheless, for several years afterwards, virtually every company that I spoke to proudly professed that they were following the Spotify model. What this really meant, as far as I could tell, was that they'd stopped calling groups of people teams and started calling them tribes instead. Around the same time, the state of DevOps reports were describing in some detail what kinds of activities were correlated with success in software development. This was based on evidence and data and a scientifically justifiable approach to its collection and analysis. But Henrik's pretty descriptions influenced more people. This doesn't mean that the data was irrelevant. It doesn't mean that Henrik was wrong. It means that how you present ideas matters as well as the ideas that you present. Long term, I don't think you can make good recommendations or win an argument without good data, but it's not enough on its own. You also need to find a way to make your arguments compelling, as Henrik did. What Spotify and Henrik did was good. How people understood it was not. That's where the data helps to make the case stronger, I think. The State of DevOps report and the book that describes the science behind it, Accelerate, are both invaluable starting points to make arguments from data. 
You can make generic claims from that data. For example, there's no trade-off between speed and quality. High-performing teams outperform low performers by multiple orders of magnitude for some measures of performance. High-performing teams spend 44% more time on new features than low performers, and companies that employ high-performing teams have on average a 50% higher market capitalization value over a three-year period than those that don't. If your company is fixing its plans too far ahead, which is a very common problem, how about this from a study at Microsoft? Two-thirds of product ideas create zero or negative value for the company that creates them. The only sane response to this fact is to optimise to have lots of ideas so that you can discard the bad ones. There are lots of studies that I rely on. Check out some of my other videos on this channel for some more suggestions. Data, though, is essential to making a reasoned argument. If you don't have data to back your arguments, then first of all, you're just guessing, so you're almost certainly wrong. Second, go and find some. Home source data is a very valuable in convincing people. I once led a team that wanted to pay off a big technical debt. Our product owner was very good, but also very focused on feature delivery. I compiled a long list of all of the things that we'd like to change and took it to her. She told me that I'd need to cost justify every change. I went away rather disappointed, but she was right. In attempting to cost justify the changes that we wanted, I eliminated over half of them myself. Where we had evidence, we used it to make the case for a change. Where we didn't, we thought about how we could gather that evidence. One of the changes that we wanted to make was to rewrite the build system. Our existing commit at that time was taking 40 minutes and we were fighting hard to keep the tests passing. So we asked every developer to record the times when they were either slowed or stopped because the build was broken. This was a very big team, hundreds of developers, so this time added up fast. Now we had a way to show the cost to the project. We got to make all of the changes that we submitted after I'd eliminated those that I couldn't justify myself. As well as the importance of evidence and data, I think that this story exemplifies another important idea. If we want to convince people of something, we need to do it on their terms rather than on ours. There's no point arguing in favour of deployment pipelines, TDD, continuous integration, or the need for fast build systems. It sounds like technical irrelevance to non-technical people. All of these things are techniques to achieve a goal, the techniques are much less important than the goal. We need to make our arguments in terms of those goals. Our aims need to be the meaningful to the person that we want to convince. If we're talking to someone from a more commercial background, we need to demonstrate how our suggestion will make us commercially more efficient. If we're talking to somebody uh, from a security background, then we need to explain how our changes will make things more secure. Now, don't get me wrong, deployment pipelines, test-driven development, continuous integration and pair programming are great techniques, but they are good because of the results that they produce, not intrinsically because of themselves. So talk about the results and avoid mentioning techniques or using jargon altogether. In the past, I have described this as a form of internal technical marketing. Not something that lots of us are comfortable with, perhaps, but important nonetheless. If you don't have the evidence to back up your arguments, you need to find a way to collect it. That is, to try to define an experiment. Pick the lowest cost way that you can think of to try out your idea. Think about what data you could collect that would demonstrate that your guess was a good one or a bad one. Think about what may get in the way of you finding an answer, and so figure out how to control the variables. If you can carry out your experiment without asking permission, great, do it. If not, you're back to persuading your boss or your teammates that now the experiment is a good idea. Making your experiment as cheap and as simple as possible will help with that. 
as well as convincing people this experimental approach is really a good idea because it also stops us from going too far ahead with bad ideas or bad guesses. These days it's my preference to treat all important work decisions as experiments and so to think about how to make them as small and controlled as I can. If data isn't enough, what else is there? Well, we can use the trump card, the most powerful technique of all. We can fix a problem that the person that we'd like to convince really cares about. If you are convinced that you're on the right track with your idea, then it's probably worth taking some chances with. To demonstrate that this is in fact a good idea. The best way to promote your idea is to demonstrate it working. And the best way to demonstrate it working is to show it working for something that matters to the people that you're trying to convince. So find a problem that they care about and fix it for them using the tools or techniques that you think work best and are important. This is a great way to bring people onto your side. This doesn't have to be a massive problem or a complex solution. In fact, it's probably best if it's not. The ideal solution is simple and makes a small step in the right direction. Try and think of something that you can try this week and measure the results of next week. But your goal is to fix a real problem in a way that reinforces your approach. Ultimately, fixing something that matters is the only way that works long term. The other techniques are important to help to keep you honest and help you to build that trust that we talked about earlier. But making real change is what really matters here. I employ all of these techniques in my work all of the time, but I don't feel that I've really done my job unless I've left people with solutions to their problems. Even if the solutions are only small steps or experiments for them to try. Generic statements of what good looks like have a place in setting direction, but real change only comes in many small steps. Here are a few common fixes that I've tried to, as, as examples. If you have a common communication problem between people or groups of people, get them to work together on something small and specific. In pre-COVID times, I would advise you to go for a cup of coffee with somebody that you had a problem with. Not sure how well that vir a virtual coffee would work, but maybe worth a try. The aim is to try to better understand at a human level their goals and motivations and why they get in the way of what you want to do. This is a common pr approach to starting the process of breaking down silos in big organisations. Want to gain more control over your development choices? Well, first, start by making sure that you're doing a good job of those things that you can control. Change things that are easily in your power to change. Take responsibility for your own work. Take professional pride in it. One way to do that is don't pass your estimates. Don't offer options to other people that leave out the essentials. If somebody asks you for an estimate, never exclude testing, refactoring or time to design. Next, if you don't understand why you're being asked to produce a particular piece of work, ask. Don't write code for a problem that you don't understand. This does two things. It helps you to better understand the context of your work, but it also signals that the requirements aren't good enough to the people creating, which is a very common problem. Another common problem that is relatively easy to fix on a small scale, at least, is instability in development and test environments. You can start to tackle this by increasing the use of version control. Start applying some simple infrastructure as code techniques. Try to stop yourself from tolerating any repetitive tasks. If it takes four steps to prep an environment and run your system to test it, then write a script so it only takes one step, then commit the script. Offer it to your teammates so that they can use it too. If you want to introduce more automated testing, start by always writing unit tests for new code. Preferably write those tests before you write the code TDD style. You don't need to ask any, anybody else's permission to do this. You don't have to have a working continuous integration system provided by somebody else before this is useful. This is a step that's entirely yours to take. You can encourage teammates to do the same, but even if they don't, at least your code will be better tested than theirs. 
Once you've done all that you can to get your own house in order, then you can try to influence other people. Now we're back to our three strategies again. It's important to recognise that there is stuff that you can't change. Try to avoid tr falling into the trap of thinking that everything would be so much better if only all those people over there did X, so I won't do anything until everything else is perfect. Try to take responsibility for the stuff that you can change and try to actively influence the stuff that you can't. As you progress, you'll find that the reach of your influence will spread. Change happens when individuals make it happen. So start now. Thank you very much for watching.